that became really what I geek out about when it comes to Japanese culture. The place in Japanese culture where I have my own little nerd fiefdom. What is good everyone and welcome to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that is pretty true for a lot of people who either come to live in Japan or have been in Japan for some time. Foreigners in Japan tend to either come here with a particularly Japanese hobby before they arrive in the country, and for some foreigners living here over time, they end up picking up some kind of particularly Japanese hobby. I mean, this could be something like martial arts, it could be something like they were big anime fans before they came to Japan. It's also possible that they became interested in something like tea ceremony or calligraphy after arriving here. I am no exception. Now, while I did watch anime when I was a university student, and I did do martial arts for a while, I did a Japanese sword art um, that I essentially earned my black belt equivalent in, but I haven't done that in years either. Instead, I got into a brand new hobby as a result of living in Japan and it's something that has stayed with me all of this time because I developed a kind of an expertise. just finished reading the book Lost Japan by Alex Kerr and in this book he details how he got or kind of fell into the world of Japanese antiques and ended up actually being an antique dealer because the case was a lot of Japanese just weren't very interested in old Japanese things including artwork and so he found that he was able to basically buy things in Japan and sell them to foreign clients at a profit. Now, it made me realize that, you know, I might really enjoy learning about and maybe even collecting some Japanese antiques, but I didn't know anything about it, and I was definitely not into Western antiques. But I guess being in Japan and different culture and different aesthetic, I developed an interest just from reading about it in this book by Alex Kerr. And so... It all began with me walking into a small shop in the town where I was living and I didn't really know what anything was. I was walking around the shop looking at various items and I didn't really know what I was looking at for the most part. I was thinking maybe I'd see something inspiring, maybe I'd see something cool that I'd buy, maybe learn about, but I had no plan. And then in the back corner of the shop, I found leaning against the wall, I mean it wasn't even on display, but it was a framed picture, and I pulled it away from the wall and saw that it was a three page picture of some kind of samurai scene. And I later found out, or figured out rather, that it was a scene of Tokugawa Ieyasu being chased by Sanada Yukimura. It's a pretty famous battle scene. It's depicting one of the only battles that Tokugawa Ieyasu ever lost. He is the man who eventually united Japan under his rule and established the Edo period shogun, um, shogunate. And that reign lasted for almost 300 years. And this was a print of him being chased by another famous samurai, Sanada Yukimura. And when I saw this print, I thought, I, I have to have it. It's really cool. I really like it. And so I bought it. It was 30,000 yen, so about $300. And I took it home and realized I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what I had in my hands. I didn't even know it was a print. I didn't really know what a Japanese woodblock print was compared to like a painting or anything else like that. Because like I said, I wasn't really into the world of antiques or art at that time. So I have this piece in my apartment. I don't know what it is. I don't even know if it's real, if it's original. 
And so that took me down the rabbit hole of research. Unfortunately, the woman who owned the shop that I bought it in did not know anything because her husband had been the collector and he had unfortunately passed away. And so she couldn't tell me anything about it. So I had to just dive in. I found books that I ordered. I found a book in the local library that was in English actually. And I did a lot of time on the internet. And eventually it developed into a full-fledged hobby. I ended up with a collection of my own. And I actually followed in the footsteps of Alex Kerr as a dealer in that I realized after making connections with certain print dealers that when I moved back to the States to go to graduate school, I could actually sell prints in America on eBay for profit. And so this mini business that I created, buying prints in Japan and selling them in the US, was actually part of the reason why I was able to pay my way through graduate school. As a result of that, obviously, a few thousand prints passed through my hands and through that time I got to be very familiar with recognizing signatures, recognizing the quality or the condition of prints, and I could read or estimate about when the date was that the print was made, whether it was an original or whether it was a reprint or a, even a vintage reprinting, and that became really what I geek out about when it comes to Japanese culture. The place in Japanese culture where I have my own little nerd fiefdom. And it's something that I find interesting today as well. It hasn't gone away. Uh, I own a house now and so, so part of my remaining collection is really so that they can be displayed or shared with people who come to visit. And yeah, most of my prints have been sold off. My collection is actually very small compared to what I had at one time. But I realized I didn't really want to be a collector. I really wanted to keep the pieces that either had a story for me or that had some kind of significance that I liked because they were part of my life or because it was a particularly artistic piece that I thought would be great to display. Case in point, this print here, which is of Lake Kawaguchiko and this is where I lived basically when I was in the countryside. This is actually a reprinting, it's not an original printing and I'll get into some details about how to tell the difference. So if you come here as a tourist or you live here already, you can actually take a look at prints and have a little idea of what you might be looking at. So. Please stick with this video if you're interested in those details. If you just wanted to hear the story about how I geeked out about something in Japan, that story is basically that's it. That's what I've just told. Stick around for the details of the prints themselves, but otherwise, if you enjoyed the first part of the video and buying prints really isn't your thing, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and let's go into the details now. As I mentioned, this print here of Mount Fuji with the cherry blossoms is a reprinting. And this is an original of a modern print that I bought directly from the publisher. But let's get into the older items and into how we can tell what is a real print, what is an original, and how to judge its condition and figure out who made it. And I'm going to share a little bit of my collection with you. The primary portion of my collection is in this art folio, which keeps the prints very nice. I don't often have my prints on display because they will fade and they will take on a browning effect if they're out in the sunlight and air too much. So I've taken on the very Japanese style of rotating my pieces so that they're never out on the wall or um, on display anywhere for too long of a time. Now there are some different ways to tell if a print is real or not. One of the primary ways to begin with is the actual paper. Now I've had, as I mentioned, a few thousand prints pass through my hands, so I've become very familiar with what the paper should be like, how to recognize old paper and recognize what the print should feel and look like in hand. Now this print 
is a good example of a kabuki print and the condition would not be considered all that great even though the, the colors are vibrant and it's a very strong printing the back of the print actually has a backing added to it so either someone put this on here so that they could hang it on a wall uh, or I don't know there's various reasons why people would put a backing on it but it's not supposed to look like that however you can still tell that you can see the print through the paper and that's one of the ways to tell that it's an actual print if you have a modern printing on modern paper that came out of a printer you're not going to have that kind of bleed through. Now this is actually not a very good example because there's the backing. Let me pull out a better example of bleed through of the paper. If you can see basically the entirety of the print on the back like this, just more like a faded version of the original of the side that you would display this is a sign of an actual woodblock printed woodblock print not a modern day printer another way to tell whether the print is on the correct type of paper is to hold it up to the light and you should see depending on which way the print is oriented, but you should either see some vertical or horizontal lines in the paper. In this particular version, they are horizontal, and that is where they lay the handmade washi Japanese paper onto these chain racks for drying. And so those lines develop because they were laid on those chains to dry. So that's another way to tell if it's a handmade paper and that will make it more likely to be original if you see those lines. Of course, depending on the condition, you're going to have various yellowing and browning. It depends how the print was stored and how people kept it. There's a number of things that affect the value of the print. Like this particular print doesn't have much in the way of margins. The print, prints were very typically trimmed for display or because they tacked it on a wall and they didn't care about the margins. And so, of course, collectors of art in any genre are going to appreciate when they feel like the piece is completely whole. So as you can see, this particular print still has its margins around it. And a lot of times artists will have a description or the date or something actually printed in the margins. And so if that's been cut off, well, uh, you, ha you have less information to glean from the print itself, unless you're familiar with it. There are a bunch of other ways to tell the difference between original and reprints. For example, the coloration. This is a particularly vibrant print, but reprints of this use more modern inks and so right here this sunset this is actually a really famous and popular print that has been reprinted in you know newly cut wood blocks and newly done style but with modern inks the sunset appears more reddish orange whereas the original inks fade to this kind of burnt color this kind of burnt brownish orange so it's small details like that that you learn about over time that can help you identify if print is real or not. This print also has very, and I'll probably have to do a close up of this because it's probably hard to see from there, but it has a very strong wood grain pattern actually in the picture of the print. And because these were printed from wood blocks and wood has grain, that grain would be reproduced on the print itself. And so that's yet another way to tell an original. If you've got a reprint that's on new blocks, the grain is going to be completely different. If you've got a print that has no grain at all, so it's done from the original painting rather than a print model, there won't be wood grain, period. 
and it'll just be the colors and you can often look at a print and tell that it's not done from woodblock because there's no wood grain anywhere. Now, if a print was very popular and it was printed many, 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 many times, the wood grain will wear down and so it becomes less and less visible. So that's not always the perfect indicator. It's all of these things put together. Another small thing that will affect value is this one, even though it has its margins, there are four clear pinholes across the top. Someone tacked this into a wall or onto a screen or something at some point. And of course, the more pinholes or insect damage or little torn corners um, that happen, the more the value will go down. Now remember, these aren't paintings. And so I think a lot of people have this image that prints are really, really expensive because they're old and because they're famous and they're a really well-known part of Japanese art culture. But there were hundreds, if not thousands, of certain prints printed. And so they're not particularly rare necessarily. Of course, many of them get lost over time, fires, earthquakes, thrown in the trash, water damage, whatever it might be. Certainly there's a lot of prints that have disappeared and, you know, that compared to the original number that were printed, there's far, far less. But I am far from the only person in the world who owns this print. This is from um, Yoshitoshi's 100 Aspects of the Moon series, and it's one of the more famous series in ukiyo-e, and very, very popular. So this is actually one of my more expensive prints that I have. But that being said, if I sold this on eBay back when I had my business, I probably would have sold it for about three to four hundred dollars. So it's not like we're talking thousands of dollars here. This other one here, despite being older, is of less famous subject matter, and I would probably get less than a hundred dollars for this, even though this one is pretty nice, very, very nice colors. So it's not like it's a huge money maker that I had when I was doing this print business. When it was all said and done after three years of selling prints, I did an average, uh, I did the math and found out the average profit that I had made was about $36 for each print that I sold. So we're not talking wild, you know, amounts of money here. So let us know in the comments, what is the particular culture that you geek out about when it comes to Japan? If it's anime or manga, that's pretty common. And I had a funny comment from a friend of mine who said, you realize that collecting woodblock prints is basically just collecting 19th century manga, which, yeah, he's got a good point. Now, while I own some modern 20th century prints, I actually have the majority of my collection being from the 19th century. So we're talking the Meiji era, which is about 1864, 1865 to the early 20th century, and also from the late Edo period, so just before the era changed. And the real way you can tell the difference between Edo era prints and Meiji era prints is the inks that are used. If you have far more vibrant colors, especially vibrant reds such as these, this tells you that it's from the Meiji era. You see, Meiji era was the opening up of Japan to the outside world, which also meant importing new things into the country. That included inks from Europe. So this vibrant red ink you see here is originally from Europe, imported to Japan, and it tends to keep this color despite its age. Now, if you go back to an Edo era print, such as this print, this print, these banners are of the Edo era red color, and they faded this kind of reddish brown, like almost a rust color. And this dye was made from, or ink rather, was made from beets, and it faded, it didn't have the staying power of the later Meiji era dyes. So if you're looking at a print in a shop and it's got vibrant red 
and you're convinced that it's old enough to actually be 19th century, it's going to be from the Meiji era. If you've got something where it's really faded like this, and we're talking like the Hiroshige and Hokusai, those famous scenes of Japan that are done in the Edo period, they're going to have the more faded colors. I do have a couple of Hiroshige prints, and you can see that here. This is from the 100 Views of Edo series. Um, sorry, this one is upside down. But these have very, very faded colors. These also happen to have a paper backing on the back. So even though they are famous Hiroshige prints, at a flea market, which is where I bought these particular items, they're not going to cost you more than about 40 to $50. They're not that expensive when they're in this condition. Condition plays a huge role. Is there a backing or not? Are there pinholes or not? How good are the colors? Does it seem like a relatively early printing because you can see the wood grain pattern in there? There's a famous Hiroshige print. I'm sorry, I forget which one it is exactly, but it's of, I think, Ueno Cohen, Ueno Park. And there's a hill in the printing. And at some point that hill got either rubbed off or knocked off the block. So a version with the hill clearly visible is going to be worth a lot more. I generally try to choose the scenes that were evocative or things that I enjoyed. A particular favorite of mine, again, not in very good condition, is this one from Azon. This is from the Edo period. The condition isn't great, but it's an absolutely beautiful composition. It's just, I think, a remarkable version or a remarkable example of the art form that was being done at that time. And it's, it, I just find it extremely elegant. And I love this print. And I would love to get prints, more prints like this, perhaps in a little better condition, but you know, the better the condition, the more it's going to cost. I suppose I should show the original print that started everything. It's what's known as a triptych because it comes in three panels. Here are the first two. Here we have Sanada Yukimura on the black horse with a few samurai vassals. And they are chasing Tokugawa Iyasu on this horse, this white horse here with the red tassels. This print isn't particularly famous. The condition is pretty good. The paper is in good condition. The colors are quite faded. Quite honestly, the $300 I paid for it was too expensive. Honestly, a better about similar condition piece like this in a catalog would probably go about 150 to 200. So I did overpay, but I didn't overpay because this sparked a brand new hobby. It sparked an interest. It took me down this road of brand new knowledge and I've come out of it as somewhat of an expert on a particular topic in Japanese culture. And it's an opportunity I would never, ever trade for just the paltry 100 or $150 I paid too much. So I'm happy that this print gave me the opportunity to learn so much, gain so much enjoyment, help pay for grad school actually, so it more than paid for itself in the end. So I'm so grateful for having, first of all, read that book, which sparked the interest to even go looking in the first place. It got me out the door, it got me chasing that experience, and it led me to something that was genuinely wonderful that ended up happening in my life. So, there it is, where I geek out about Japanese culture, where I find particular interest enough that I went a little bit crazy and ended up having a few thousand prints in my possession at one point. It's whittled down to a collection of about two dozen or so, and monetarily they're not the most prized or amazingly expensive prints, but to me it's a very special collection 
and I will probably add to it again in the future sometime. I'm not currently in a phase where I'm looking or buying or anything like that, but we shall see. And I genuinely hope you enjoyed watching this and that you got some information out of it. Thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you appreciated it. If you have any specific questions, please ask them down below because I'm a small channel and so I'm able to answer questions. I see them pretty much every day and I can answer any specific questions you might have. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching the video. Look for my new ones every single Friday. Different videos about Japan, society, life and culture. If you enjoyed watching this one, remember, hit that, subscribe, and I will catch you on the next one. Peace.